Buenos días. Gracias por su asistencia, muy especialmente al a los presidentes y miembros del patronato y de la Comisión Ejecutiva de Función, al presidente de NERCLUB y al presidente de ARIAE, que junto con Mr. Motherway será, son los dos keynote speakers del día. Este es nuestro octavo simposio. Eh, todos los hemos abordado con eh, entusiasmo y a medida que vamos aumentando el número, ese entusiasmo asociado a la satisfacción aumenta. Gracias al proyecto, a sus impulsores y a todos ustedes que siempre han estado aquí con nosotros. Eh, el simposio, como eh, señalaba el presidente de FUNSEM al inicio, eh, tiene esta jornada empresarial y al día siguiente, desde el primer simposio, una jornada académica que eh, realiza y organiza la parte de FUNSEAN que está, digamos, bajo el amparo académico de la Universidad de Barcelona con el mismo tema. Ambos, ambas jornadas estudian en esta edición la eficiencia energética. Lo que se pretende, lo que se pretende es una fusión de las reflexiones empresariales y académicas en el bien entendido que el diseño del proyecto es un diseño conjunto y que ni la investigación pretende alejarse de las necesidades que plantea el sector empresarial y, como ha señalado el presidente de NERCLUB, los trabajos de la cátedra también permiten, en una versión de más eh, amable en su lectura, eh, transmitir las investigaciones que se hacen en la cátedra. Y el informe último de eficiencia energética de Funsean es un reflejo de este esfuerzo. Y me cabe el honor de presentar en la edición de este año como keynote speaker a Mr. Brian Motherway, director de la División de Eficiencia Energética de la Agencia Internacional de la Energía. Mr. Brian Motherway ocupó primero el puesto de Chief Executive en la Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Es ingeniero por la Universidad de Pensilvania y recibió el grado de doctor por el muy reputado centro Trinity College. A lo largo de estos últimos años, como ya ha señalado la secretaria de Estado y también el presidente de NERCLUB, la Agencia Internacional de la Energía ha desempeñado un papel activo en la promoción de la eficiencia energética para mitigar el cambio climático, mejorar la seguridad energética y hacer crecer las economías al tiempo que ofrece beneficios ambientales y sociales. La eficiencia energética, y esto es un clásico de los informes de la Agencia, se erige como el primer combustible de un sistema energético sostenible a nivel global. Según el último informe de la agencia, a pesar de los esfuerzos, desde 2015 las mejoras en la eficiencia energética global se están desacelerando. Lo ha puesto de manifiesto el presidente en el club y lo ha puesto de manifiesto la, la secretaria de Estado. Una tendencia que tiene importantes implicaciones para los consumidores, las, empre las empresas y el medio ambiente. And in this vein, Mr. Brian Motherway, head of the Energy Efficiency Division at the International Energy Efficiency Agency, will analyze in detail the recent slowdown in energy efficiency, public policies, and investment trends. Mr. Motherway, I would like to thank you 
for accepting our invitation to participate in this edition of the FUNSEAM Business Symposium. I am convinced that your works will be of great interest to all of us and will help us to better understand what the energy efficiency challenges are. The floor is yours. Gracias. Buenos dias. Good morning, and thank you for the kind invitation to join you here today. It's a great pleasure to be participating in this symposium with so many illustrious expert, experts from Spain. And it's, it's certainly a pleasure to be in Barcelona again. I can tell you it was raining very heavily when I left Paris yesterday, so you definitely uh, have better weather than we have. And I thank you for the invitation to come and share it with you. So, as Professor Costa said, we are concerned about global trends in energy efficiency, and I want to spend some time telling you about this, about what those trends are, and also what we think that some of the actions that are called for out of that are in relation to energy efficiency. You will hear me focus a lot on policy, because it is our firm view that energy efficiency needs firmer policy action. And when we examine energy efficiency right around the world, we see progress being made where firm policy action is being taken. And when there is no policy action, there is no progress. Energy efficiency is still very dependent on actions by governments, by regions, by cities. And therefore, we put a focus on calling on governments all over the world to accelerate and strengthen their actions on energy efficiency. Whoops. I'm not quite finished. Well, thank you for your attention this morning. Yes. Okay. Um, so. Let me start with the most important global trend, which is greenhouse gas emissions. After several years of remaining steady globally, the last two years have shown quite a worrying increase in global energy-related CO2 emissions. This chart goes till 2018, and soon we will publish the 2019 data, and it is not good news. We see that in, despite all the discussions in society and despite all the focus on the need for action to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, actually the trend is not only not going down, but it is still going up. And so in 2018, we saw the highest ever global emissions of CO2 uh, driven by increasing energy demand uh, in many parts of the world. And as Professor Costa has said, this is very closely linked to a slowdown in global energy efficiency progress. Here it is measured by how much energy we use per unit of GDP. And you can see that up to 2015, we were making some forward progress and that the rate of improvement in energy efficiency was getting better by every year by almost 3% in 2015. Now, more recently, we are still making progress. So each year, the world does become more efficient in how it uses energy, but the rate of progress has slowed dramatically. And in fact, the rate of progress in 2018 was less than half the average rate of progress this decade, and in fact, was the lowest this decade. So we are quite concerned to see that despite the stronger need, and as Professor Costa and our previous speakers have all emphasized, the central importance of energy efficiency in meeting our sustainability challenges associated with energy, in fact, the trend is going in the wrong direction, and we see a global slowdown in progress on energy efficiency. Now, this trend is driven by a number of factors. Some of them are short-term factors that may change from year to year. For example, 2018 saw some unusual weather effects. Uh, in the United States, for example, it was quite a cold winter, and therefore gas demand for heating homes went up quite considerably. In parts of Asia, it was a very warm summer, 
and therefore electricity demand for cooling went up quite dramatically. So different trends happen from year to year. But there is one more longer term trend that is driving uh, the slowdown in efficiency progress that I think is of more signif significance. And that relates to the interplay of our progress on technical efficiency versus wider societal trends in how we use energy. And I will try to explain this, that each year we, our homes and our cars and our appliances all become a little bit more efficient because technology is improving. We are getting better at building buildings. We are getting better at building appliances that use less energy. And this is what I call technical efficiency. And each year you can see that uh, we are making some progress, though there has been some slowdown. But the other effect on our energy use is how we use it in structural terms. So in many parts of the world, for example, uh, industry is shifting to lighter industry and more services. And in the early part of this decade, that is exactly the trend we saw globally, that the technical gains we made were actually enhanced by structural shifts in industry away from heavy manufacturing towards lighter manufacturing and services. However, since then, we see the trend going in the opposite direction because the shift towards lighter industry has stalled. And what we see instead is shifts in other parts of society towards more energy use. And in this I mean, for example, e each home we build is becoming more efficient, but we are building larger homes. We have lower le levels of occupancy. We have more appliances in those homes. Similarly, in transport, every car that is sold today is more efficient, but we are selling more cars. They are larger. People are driving them further. People are shifting from public transport to private transport. And you can see in this chart that those wider effects are really reducing the progress we're making on technical efficiency and driving the slowdown in global improvement. This raises many important questions for society to tackle, including the clear implication that energy efficiency is affected by many domains beyond energy of policy. Because you can see, for example, the effect of transport policy, housing policy, urban planning, and many other dimensions that have a strong influence on our global progress on energy efficiency. And you can see that these areas are becoming more significant and having a stronger effect than our progress on the efficiency of technology itself. And I can illustrate that with one example that I've already mentioned uh, about the balance between technical efficiency and wider societal trends. And I'm just going to look at homes that we're building here. So the technical efficiency gains we have made in homes have dramatically reduced the amount of energy that homes all over the world are using. This is a, this is a chart of the whole planet's use of energy in homes. And the trend is interestingly the same in every part of the world. Homes are becoming more efficient. We are building better insulation, better windows. The appliances are becoming more efficient. We are making positive progress in those areas. But on the other hand, we see, obviously, weather has become more extreme, population is going up. I've mentioned that we are buying more appliances and we are using them more often. We are living, on average, in larger homes. Occupancy is going down, so fewer people are living in every home. And you can see that all of these factors vastly outweigh the progress we have made on the technical efficiency of building themselves. As I mentioned, this is a global trend. In every region in the world, homes are becoming bigger. But of course, it's important to note that in, in Spain or France or the United States, the, the concept of a home becoming slightly bigger is quite different than if you think about Indonesia or India or sub-Saharan Africa, where people are maybe finally being able to live in their own home for the first time, have more space to live. All of this brings benefit to people's lives, but of course puts pressure on our energy demand globally. So, all of this pressure on energy use and the responses we need relate to policy and investment. And here we see that these sectors are not responding as they need to. I will talk about uh, policy in more detail in a few minutes, but first I want to say that policy progress, which we measure through various indicators, 
has become quite flat in the last few years. We see few countries introducing new efficiency policies, and we see few countries strengthening the policies they have already put in place. And this is quite a paradox to me, and I would be interested in other people's views, because it seems that we spend more time talking about energy efficiency and sustainable energy, but that doesn't seem to translate into concrete policy action. And we see this globally. We see in the last few years uh, new measures are not being introduced as quickly. We see existing measures such as building standards or appliance standards are not being strengthened. So the actual policy work required for energy efficiency is slowing down despite the increasing need for such action. On investment, over the last five years, global investment in energy efficiency has stayed more or less flat. It has increased by 1% or 2%, but no more than that. And this is in the context where, according to our analysis, if efficiency is to play its role in meeting the Paris commitments for climate change, energy efficiency investment must double in the next decade and then double again in the following decade. And yet we see we are making nowhere near that level of progress. I want to make the point on a investment in energy efficiency that there is a very close link between investment activity and policy. And you can see this in different parts of the world. And if you look at the regions where there is most investment, China, for example, almost all of the investment in energy efficiency is in the industrial sector. And that is because that is where the strongest efficiency policies are. Here in Europe, most of the investment is in the building sector. And that is because a lot of policy focus at a European level has been on buildings energy efficiency, and that has driven investment. This to us shows that policy, the right policy, can drive investment in efficiency, but as I have said, we are not seeing that degree of policy response that we need to see. So, I have told you the bad news, now I want to talk about the future and what is possible and how, with the right actions, energy efficiency can make a much stronger contribution than it is making today. Um, first of all, I think it is clear that we all know that every possible action in every domain of energy is going to be required if we are to have any chance of getting back on track in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions and the other dimensions of, of sustainable energy and the clean energy transitions. And this is very clear when you compare current trends that we are seeing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions versus what we call the stated policy scenario. So this is if all the policies that have been promised, all the targets have been set, were to be met, we would in fact not see a dramatic decrease in emissions, we would basically see them just flattening, them off, flattening off. And if we compare that with where we need to go, which what we call our sustainable development scenario, by which we meet the Paris ambition in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but we also meet other global goals such as reducing local air pollution and providing energy access to all people on the planet, then there are a very large number of actions that are required to go from the path we are on today to the path we would wish to be on. And we can look at these in a lot of detail. I won't go into uh, every detail here, except to say, of course, everything starts with energy efficiency. And in our view, there is no plausible, achievable, or affordable energy transition that is not led by energy efficiency, because it makes every other action cheaper and more possible if we can put a downward pressure on energy demand by becoming more efficient. And you can see from this chart that, that it, it cuts across every sector, it cuts across many different technologies, it links to other policies such as the relationship between energy efficiency and renewable energy, and it links to the wider goals we have in terms of achieving the Paris targets and everything that goes with that. So many policies will be required in all sectors. Um, we have developed what this might look like through what we call the IEA's Efficient World Strategy. And this is effectively spelling out what I showed you in the last chart in terms of what is possible in the next 20 years if we were to put a stronger focus on energy efficiency. And the headline here is, if we just focus on technologies that are already available 
and that are already cost effective. So I'm not talking about new innovative technologies, I'm not talking about prices coming down, all of which will happen and will add to the opportunity. If all we did was deploy every energy efficient technology that is available today and that is already cost effective, in the next 20 years we could double global energy efficiency. So at a time where we expect the global economy to double between now and 2040, the world could actually be using the same amount of energy in 2040 as it is today, while delivering that, that growth of doubling the global economy. So we focus on this opportunity. It requires returning to the 2015 level of delivering a 3% annual gain in energy efficiency. If the world collectively were to deliver just a 3% gain every year, in the next 20 years, the global economy would be twice as efficient the global economy would be twice as large, but we would be using the same amount of energy as we are today. And that is where we focus our attention in working with governments and industry and all players to focus on how can we deliver this scenario, the efficient world strategy as we call it. It applies to every sector and it applies to every part of the world. So first of all, in industry, we could see that the, the global output of industry could more or less double, uh, and yet the energy demand would uh, be more or less the same as it is today across industry. An interesting learning here is that many governments and many industrial sectors have focused strongly on the largest industrial sectors and the most energy intense, and that's chemicals, cement, iron and steel, aluminium, and in many cases these sectors have become much more efficient in recent years particularly in parts of the world where those sectors are growing. So an interesting example is the country with the most energy efficient cement sector in the world is India. And this is not because they have deployed particularly strong policies, though they do have good efficiency policies in industry. It's because so many cement plants have been built in the last decade and each plant is much more efficient because of technology getting better that now globally India has the most efficient uh, 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 cement sector in the world. Of course that doesn't compensate for the fact that it is now a much larger sector using much larger amounts of energy but it just demonstrates that as sectors grow and as technology improves particularly in those very large sectors they do become more efficient. And all of those large intensive sectors have become efficient in recent years, though more, more progress can be made. But because of that focus on the very large intensive sectors, many countries have neglected to look at smaller energy users in medium-sized industry and in lighter manufacturing, such as food and beverages, light engineering, and sectors such as that. And that means in the next two decades, we think that almost three quarters of the efficiency opportunity actually sits in those lighter, less intensive sectors. Now, that is interesting from a policy making point of view because in the past most energy efficiency policy for industry has focused on engaging a small number of very large energy users through programs such as energy management systems, uh, incentives for large users, direct engagement in, in training and networking. But in the next couple of decades, policy will have to shift to find ways to engage a much larger number of smaller energy users. And you can imagine that uh, a cement or a steel or an aluminium uh, industry that maybe 20% of its costs go to energy has a very strong focus on efficiency. Whereas if you start moving to sectors where maybe only 2% of costs go on energy, it's a much harder job to encourage those sectors to become more efficient and to work with them. And yet that is the challenge we have in the coming years, to find ways to engage millions of firms that each of them are not very large energy users or very intensive users, but between them account for the bulk of the efficiency opportunity in industry. In buildings, it's f first worth noting that building growth around the world continues to be very fast. Every week in the world, the amount of building space added in the world is the equivalent of the entire size of Paris. That is how much buildings we are still building around the planet. 
and two-thirds of those buildings are built with no efficiency standard or code whatsoever. So we must not lose the focus on the new buildings we are building all around the world, which for the most part are still not being built with high standards of efficiency. And of course, those buildings will be with us for many decades, locking in energy inefficiency, locking in energy demand and carbon emissions. And we in the IEA, uh, recognizing that, are working very strongly now with the large emerging economies where a lot of this growth is taking place. So we have very active efficiency programs in China, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and many other regions where a lot of this growth is continuing at the fastest pace. In other parts of the world, such as here in Western Europe, of course, the debate is much more about taking the existing stock and making it more efficient. Uh, and we see that the bulk of the opportunities for becoming more efficient in buildings relate to heating and in many parts of the world also cooling. I think many of you will know that in the last few years, air conditioning and the cooling sector has become a strong focus uh, for energy efficiency debates. And this is in recognition that it is, in fact, the fastest growing sector for electricity demand in buildings and will continue to be so. Every second, as we sit here, five air conditioners are sold somewhere in the world. Uh, and th most of those air conditioners are not very energy efficient. And we look at global trends. We see countries such as US or Japan, where effectively every home has an air conditioner. And you compare that, say, to India, where only 5% of homes have air conditioners. And you can imagine that India is a hotter place than many parts of the world uh, and has a much stronger social and health need for cooling. And as people become able to afford it, they will buy air conditioners and they will start to use them. But those air conditioners that they are typically buying are less than half the efficiency as what they could be buying. We have analyzed air conditioning markets all over the world, and in every single market, US, Japan, Western Europe, Africa, Asia, the typical air conditioner being bought is less than half as efficient as it could be just by people shifting to the best conditioners that are already available in those markets. So this is not something that requires major innovation or new technologies. It just requires policies that push people in the direction of buying more efficient air conditioners, whether that is standards or incentives or marketing campaigns or probably a combination of all of those things. And it is interesting for many countries, air conditioning has become in some ways the most urgent efficiency problem, not only because of climate change, but because of the pressure on their electricity systems. In many parts of Asia and the Middle East, already at peak times during the day, air conditioning represents almost half the electricity load, and that is only going to continue to grow. And many electricity systems will not be able to cope if people keep buying inefficient air conditioners and using them during the hardest parts of the day. And it is, this is focusing many countries' policymakers on the need to change policy in that area. Finally, in transport, um, again, we could double the global level of activity in transport in the next two decades in terms of passenger miles, uh, people moving around, and yet energy demand could stay flat. Of course, we look at emerging technologies such as electric vehicles and uh, things like that, but of course, most of the savings still come in conventional internal combustion engine vehicles, both passengers and cars. Many countries have standards for making their cars more efficient. Relatively few have standards for making their trucks more efficient. And this is a major focus uh, now for many <coughs> excuse me, policymakers where truck energy demand is growing, if smaller than cars, but is growing much faster than um, energy uh, demand in cars. Both need a focus. Electrification, of course, will become more prominent, but it's worth remembering that of the more than one billion cars in the world today, about five million are electric. So we are at the beginning, I think, in, of a major trend towards electrification in vehicles, but we are really only just at the beginning of it. Interestingly, we focus a lot on cars, but for many parts of the world, the, the, the much faster trend is in two-wheelers. There are five million electric cars in the world, but there are a quarter of a billion electric motorbikes. 
Uh, most of those are in China, but they're also fast growing in many parts of Asia and in other parts of the world. And if you visit major cities in China now compared to even just 10 years ago, they have become much quieter places uh, because of the shift away from uh, internal combustion engine motorbikes to uh, electric motorbikes, which are now universal in China and growing very fast in India, Indonesia, and many other regions. Um, we have a range of policy recommendations uh, that we work with governments on, uh, and I won't go into detail on those, but I just want to stress the opportunity that efficiency still offers that we are not taking. And if we were to take all those opportunities, the benefits w are multidimensional and well beyond just the environmental dimension. So countries that import a lot of energy, including here in the EU, could see their imports uh, dramatically fall, saving large amounts of money and improving the security of their energy systems. Um, industry could become much more competitive by lowering its energy bills, and all of us could save a lot of money. In fact, our collective spend on energy as consumers could be half a trillion lower in the one year of 2040 alone if we were all to avail of all the efficiency opportunities. And of course, it complies with wider goals, including Paris and the Sustainable Development Goal relating to energy. Um, one policy area I want to focus on just briefly before I close is digitalization, which has been mentioned already. We see digitalization changing all parts of energy and creating opportunities for systems to become more efficient and more cost effective. But in my view, certainly, the effects on energy efficiency of digital technology could become even stronger than in any other part of the system. We see already in our lives, all of us with our smartphones, with our connected televisions, with uh, cars and refrigerators and washing machines becoming a, a connected, with many buildings being controlled now by energy management systems. We see already a shift from, in our homes for example, each device being a standalone energy user to a shift towards connectivity, optimization in the home, matching supply from solar panels, for example, with demand in the home, that shift is already well underway and bringing many benefits. The next phase, of course, is to think of that in a wider system terms, which is beginning to happen where the smart home is actually part of a smart grid. And we think about efficiency not just in end use, but in system terms. And let me give you an example. In many countries now, including Spain, many parts of the US, many parts of Europe, there are times during the day when the supply of solar energy is so large that it is effectively, there is not enough use for it. At that moment in the day, the, the economic value of efficiency is effectively zero because there is cheap, clean power available looking for a use. Two or three hours later in the same day, the economic value of efficiency might be extremely large because the sun has gone down, demand has gone up, supply at the peak is being supplied by expensive carbon intensive plants, and suddenly the value of efficiency is fundamentally different. So you can see that we start to think about the efficiency of an appliance or a home or a car, not in the long term always, but also minute to minute and second to second as part of a optimization of a whole system of supply and demand and not just thinking about lowering the end use of energy efficiency. Um, so therefore it is possible that digitalization could dramatically increase the overall system of efficiency, but it won't happen automatically. In fact, already we see upward pressure on energy demand because every smartphone we have Every smart appliance uses energy to connect to the system, drives energy demand in data centers and in the transmission of data and communications. So there's already an upward pressure, but the resulting benefits in terms of improved optimization, greater comfort, convenience, and efficiency will only come if driven by policy. So again, there's a need for a modernization of how we think about energy efficiency. And this is something we in my team in the IEA is focusing on very heavily about how digitalization offers the opportunity to modernize how we think about energy efficiency and to create new opportunities through smart grids, smart technologies, uh, and all that goes with that. But policy will be essential. Um, we have started to think about and work with governments to talk to them about what does readiness mean 
how could a country or a government or a region be ready to benefit from the opportunities associated with digitalization in policy terms? And there are many dimensions that I won't go into, except to stress that there are many dimensions. There are energy policy dimensions in terms of market design, pricing, tariffs, consumer engagement, but there are a far wider set of issues around cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, incentives for innovation, ownership of data that governments need to be thinking about. And I can tell you that in my experience, most governments, I would say, have not really started to address these questions at the pace they will need to in the future if they want to be ready to exploit the opportunities associated with digitalization to make energy systems more efficient, cheaper, and more sustainable. So this area is something we're focusing on very generally. So you have heard me talk a lot about the role of policy, and that is because we believe this is the most important dimension where we can play a role in engaging governments all around the world to help them understand the current trends in energy efficiency, the future opportunities for energy efficiency, and the actions that they can take if they want to make their economies and their societies more efficient. And it is interesting for me to realize that whether we are in Asia, Latin America, or here in Western Europe, there are certainly differences and different cultural contexts and different political contexts, but actually energy efficiency has more in common than it has in difference because the technologies are the same, the policy options are the same, and ultimately people are much the same, and it is people who use energy and make decisions as to what to buy, how to behave, how to use technologies that determine efficiency. And with this focus on policy, I want to let you know of one activity that we are currently very excited about, which is the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. This is chaired by the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, and one of our esteemed members is the Deputy Prime Minister, Ribera, who is actively engaged with us, uh, talking about what governments can do to accelerate progress on energy efficiency. So this group of people comes from every corner of the world. About six or seven of them are current energy ministers. Several more are former energy ministers or ministers for innovation or technology, other things. Several are industry CEOs or leaders of think tanks. So they all come together with different perspectives, different types of experience, and in particular, a track record of getting things done. And that is why we have asked them to work with us to understand if a government wants to make faster progress on energy efficiency, what can we learn from experience from every part of the world in terms of what works and what doesn't work? So what are the policy options? How can these policies be best implemented and enforced? How do we engage industry and investors? And how do we work collectively to accelerate global progress on energy efficiency? This commission uh, met quite recently in Paris and we are working with them now and we will be finalizing uh, with them their recommendations which will be published in the summer in early July when we hold our fifth annual global conference on energy efficiency uh, at the IEA in Paris. And I will hope that we can welcome many of you to Paris uh, at the start of July for our global conference on energy efficiency where we will, be, we will have the commission present to launch their recommendations which will answer the question that many governments are asking, which is what actions can we take to make faster progress on energy efficiency? And I believe that we will be providing answers. We already know from around the world that faster progress is possible. We see where policy work works and we see the social, economic and environmental benefits that accrue from that. And our job now is to encourage governments and industry and around the world to work together to accelerate that progress for everyone's benefit. Thank you very much for your attention.